Welcome to the second session in Cognitive Neuroscience in the spring semester of 2021. Today we will be talking about a method, namely electroencephalography or EEG. As an introduction, I will first talk about the origin of the EEG signal in the brain, the so-called inverse problem and the history of EEG. Then uh, we will be talking about how EEG is measured in the lab and how um, event-related event potentials or ERPs are calculated, which is a very useful and powerful tool that psychologists can use in their experiments. So I will also give you a few examples of how ERPs were used in experiments. And then last but not least, we will look at advanced EEG methods and MEG. Before we start with this part of the session, I would like you to have a look at these equations, at this equation system, and solve it by determining the values for AX, Y, and Z. So please pause this video now and solve these equations. I will get back to this later and explain to you how this is relevant to EEG research. Let's start with an overview of um, EEG in relation to other neuroscientific methods. Here in this graph, you can see two properties of neuroscientific methods. This time resolution on the x-axis, the further on the left, the higher the time resolution. And on the y-axis, you can see the spatial resolution. The further down, the higher the uh, spatial resolution. And EEG is up here. So before we go into detail here, I would like to explain a bit more about what spatial, spatial and time resolution mean. So imagine we have three neural sources, A, B, and C, located somewhere in the brain, and we're using this method to measure um, the signal at this location here. So what you see is this a signal, um, some, kind, some kind of time course, some dynamic neural signal here, and um, if we look at the hypothetical underlying neural pattern of A, B, and C, we can see that um, this does, so this, this would maybe be the, the sum of these, um, a weighted sum of these individual signals. But with this method, we cannot differentiate between A, B, and C because we're measuring at a location that gets input from all three of them. So this would have a bad spatial resolution. because we cannot differentiate between these spatially separate sources. Here we would have an example of a high spatial resolution. Here we measure directly at the location, at the origin of the neural signal, and we can precisely understand what's going on at these locations here. So this has a high spatial resolution. We can separate, uh, we can spatially um, separate the origin of these individual neural sources. Let's have a look at the temporal resolution of a neural signal. So again, we have a, some kind of hypothetical true signal here, which emerges at this red dot here. And with this method, um, we can see that the signal can actually be relatively well tracked, the time dynamics, so the ups and downs, even though the small deviations might not be tracked, but um, this is a good temporal resolution because it resembles the shape of the original neural source that we in fact do not have. Um, here's an example of a method that has a bad temporal resolution. Even though the onset of that signal resembles um, the onset of the true signal, it doesn't really track the dynamic changes in the neural signal over time, that the time course of the neural signal. So let's get back to this chart and have a look where EEG, how EEG or ERP, event-related potentials, perform. So you can see it has a relatively high time resolution, actually the highest time resolution of all non-invasive methods but it also doesn't have um, but it doesn't have a very high 
spatial resolution. So the spatial resolution is relatively poor in EEG. But as you will see in the following, the spatial resolution is not necessarily um, important for many psychological research questions. So that makes EEG a powerful tool because it has this high temporal resolution. What does electroencephalography mean? Electro refers to the electric potentials. We're talking about electricity produced in the brain by individual neurons. Encephalo refers to the brain and graphy to the signal being recorded or written. So to analyze the data, of course, you need to have a record of it. So what's the origin of the EEG signal? If you remember from last session, a neuron in its resting potential is more negative on the inside than on the outside. And then what happens when there is some kind of input from another synapse? There's an influx of positive ions, and then that means we have a net negativity at this location compared to this location outside of the neuron because there is some missing positive ions compared to before, uh, whereas there's no change here. In net, uh, the net activity is negative here compared to here. So last time we've talked a lot about action potentials, um, this sudden depolarization, uh, which can last for a few milliseconds, where the axon then propagates the action potential. And if there's sufficient number of presynaptic cells, then there might be enough input of positive ions that then flow to the, um, to the um, somar of the, of, the, of the neuron, where then um, there's an action potential triggered here at the uh, trigger zone of the axon. Now, importantly, EEG is not directly related to the action potential. So EEG doesn't measure um, the action potentials of neuron, but rather something we call the postsynaptic potential. So that's uh, related to this net negativity that I was just talking about outside of a neuron. So this is, a more, this is a more transient change. It can last up to hundreds of milliseconds and um, it creates a tiny dipole due to the change in the ion distribution. So this is again too small to be measured at the scalp side. But um, if enough neurons fire in synchrony, then you can actually measure that outside of the scalp where we usually put our EEG electrodes. So what I mean by this is, for example, here you have this net negativity compared to here. This whole, um, this whole neuron becomes a dipole. And if you have excitatory postsynaptic potentials, then this would be uh, charge this way negative at the dendrites and positive at the soma. If you have an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, it would be the opposite. So a single neuron, as I said, cannot really produce uh, electricity large enough to be measured on the large scale. But because we have many neurons that often um, fire in synchrony, that means we might end up with an electricity large enough to, to accomplish that. So we have a relatively large dipole then. There's three prerequisites in order for that to happen. So the neurons must be highly synchronous, so they must fire at the same time, which is often the case um, in the way their co um, neurons are connected to one another. Um, and neurons must have the same direction of the dipole. So that means, for example, if all of them are having a, a negative a neg net negativity um, at the dendrites and a net positivity at the soma, that would be contributing to a measurable signal. And they also must have the same orientation. By orientation, I mean the actual alignment of the neurons in the tissue so for example here, they're all aligned like this, but they could also be, for example, aligned in all different directions. I will show you an example in the following. But just to um, point out one thing that could go wrong 
wrong in a sense that a measurable signal would not be accomplished. For example, here you can see they might all fire synchronously. We can't really see this here, but they definitely have the same orientation still. However, they don't have the same direction of the charge. So some of them have positive, a positivity in the, near the dendrites and the negativity, the soma, or vice versa. So what this might cause is some kind of um, zero net negativity or positivity because the um, electricity is ba basically averaging out to zero. So here you can see um, an example where the orientation of neurons is not um, aligned. So in subcortical areas, for example, um, such as the basal ganglia, you can see that the neurons are typically not aligned. So it, um, this will not contribute to the EEG signal a lot because um, no stable and um, large enough dipole could emerge that then contributes to the EEG signal. In the cortical layers, however, and this is very um, unique in the brain, the neurons are perfectly aligned. So these are the typical pyramidal cells in the cortex layers that are aligned like this. So, um, and this is why most of the EEG signal really comes from these cortical layers, which is of course interesting to many research questions because the cortex is very important um, in the um, in, in uh, cognitive functions that we're interested in. Although it might also be interesting to look at subcortical areas, this is less uh, suitable for EEG research. So let's zoom out a little bit. So we have this dipole, uh, the neural ensemble. Then if we zoom out, this is a cortex layer. You can see this is like a cortex fold. And, um, and then you can see there's uh, this, this negativity in this direction compared to the positivity in, uh, um, to this direction. Um, so a relatively large dipole. And then if we zoom out more, we can compare this location with this location. So for example, this location with this location here, and then we can measure a signal. So keep in mind whenever we're measuring um, a voltage, that's always a difference between two sides. Voltage can only be measured as the difference between two sides, um, namely between the electric potential of two sides. So we need at least two electrodes to even um, be a being able to, to measure um, any voltage. Okay, let's get back to the equation system um, that I gave you earlier. Um, now, I would be surprised if any of you could solve this because I couldn't solve it and um, actually it is not solvable. The problem is that this system is underdetermined. Um, this means that there's fewer equations than variables. So, in fact, you can, you can solve the equation system, but there's just an infinite number of solutions. So, just to give you a few examples, I don't know what, if you tried any numbers, but for example, for a equals 1, x equals 4, y equals minus 3, and z or z equals 1, you can solve this. This, this would be true, but that's not the only solution there's an infinite number of more solutions, for example, 42, 86, 38, and 124 as well. So um, why did I give you this equation system to think about? The reason is solving this equation system is similar to determining where in the brain the original signal is located that we're measuring with our EEG. And this is related to the so-called inverse problem. So the forward problem is a well-posed well question, namely the question, well, let's say we have these dipoles, we know exactly where in the brain the signal is coming from. And then we look at, uh, we can, um, if we know exactly all the dipoles that we're measuring, we can, we can see how that would look on the EEG level, like would activity we would measure at the scalp level here or here or here and so on. The inverse problem is ill-posed because it's not um, 
there's not just one solution, there's many, an infinite number of solutions to the question. The question being, if we observe this EEG pattern here, where does the EEG signal emerge from, or what is the original location of the sources? Just to give you an example here, um, say um, we have these three sources, A, B, and C, and we have electrode 1, E1. So the idea is, of course, that E1 would get input from these three sources. Um, so, for example, the activity measured at E1 would be five times the signal at A, plus three times the signal at B, plus two times the signal at C. Just as a hypothesis, you could maybe state that. And then maybe at electrode 2, E2, you have a different linear combination of these sources. So these three sources contribute to all kinds of electrodes that we have. And solving this equation would, if this was possible, then we could actually uh, tell, uh, we would actually know something about the original source. We would know exactly what was going at A, at B, and at C which could be important because maybe those are different brain areas that have a slightly different functional importance or maybe you just want to know exactly what's going on in this brain region and how this is related to a task a participant is doing. So can we solve this equation and tell, given that we have, let's say, E1, E2, E3, can we actually tell where A, um, B and C are, or how they respond to our experimental manipulation. Well, if it's really just three um, sources and three electrodes, we could do that because that wouldn't be underdetermined. But in reality, um, we have, well, we have more than three electrodes for sure. We have maybe 32, um, up to 256 electrodes, quite a lot. But um, if we increase the number further, we would still not be able to uh, cover all the different dipoles that we observe, that we have in the brain, because there's millions of dipoles that are concurrently active. So that means we have way fewer equations. The number of equations would be the number of electrodes here. So let's say we have 256 electro electrodes and equations but we still have millions of sources, so it's still underdetermined. And this is the inverse problem. The spatial um, resolution, res resolution is, of EEG is, is poor because we cannot trace back from the observed EEG signal to the original source of the, of the signal. We cannot determine A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, like all these millions of dipoles with only a limited number of electrodes. To give you a few examples of um, how, this, um, how this can affect measurements, imagine you have a dipole like this. Of course, we don't know about this dipole. We just know what we measure at the scalp side, which is, for example, whatever signal we're getting at these uh, six electrodes here. And this signal might look exactly the same, even though the underlying dipole pattern is completely different. So the signal observed by one large deep dipole might very be very like very possible uh, be the same as the signal that derives from many small dipoles that are closer to the surface. Here's another example two aligned dipoles, these locations here might induce the same EEG pattern that we observe at these electrodes compared to one larger dipole in a similar position. So the point here is, let's say, whatever data you observe here, you will not be able to tell apart this from this or this from this. Where in the brain is it coming from? How large is the dipole? That's um, impossible to tell with certainty. Um, let's continue with a little bit of history of EEG. So uh, Richard Caton was the first one to observe um, electrical impulses from the brain. He used a galvanometer to look at the surface of living rabbit and monkey brains.
So this is not necessarily what we would call nowadays um, EEG because um, it is measured from the surface of a of the um, rabbit and monkey brain, but it's the first um, electrical impulses, which is which is also what EEG is. Later in 1890, Adolf Beck found that the frequency of the electric activity of dog and rabbit brains is modulated by the light intensity. Again, not necessarily what we would call nowadays EEG, but um, it, re it, it uh, refers to a very important property of EEG, namely its um, sensitivity um, to, or it's the, an important property of EEG is the frequency, because the frequency tells us a lot about um, cognitive conditions, um, the kind of processing that is going on, and also things like, for example, the light um, intensity as you can see in this example. And then in 1924, Hans Berger was the first one to measure what we would call, call nowadays EEG, um, namely from humans, from scalp sites of humans. And he also found different frequencies, namely he compared opened and closed eyes. Again, referring to the important property um, of EEG, namely which frequency are we looking at. So this is Hans Berger and the first EEG was measured from his son's um, scalp, which is not a problem um, really. Um, why wouldn't you measure your own son? He seems happy and it's a non-invasive method, so it's not painful or harmful in any way. Um, you can see that there's a, some kind of cables connected to um, a switchboard and then this is going to some kind of um, amplifier that you can see here. And this is the first human EEG signal. This is just a sine wave as a comparison. Um, and what you can see here is, for example, this area and this one as well. This is what we call alpha band activity, alpha frequencies. That's um, a frequency band um, between 8 and 13 hertz, which is uh, very dominant in the human EEG, particularly if you're in a in a rested, um, calm state, or if you close your eyes, you can see this. It's called alpha band frequency because it's so large, you can actually see it with your bare eyes um, and without any further processing that is necessary. So the first one that was discovered and hence given the name alpha. Okay, so much about um, the introduction of the EEG as a method. Um, in the next part of today's session, we will be talking about how EEG is measured in the lab.